Good morning. And a warm welcome to Newcombe Nut Parish Church on this the first Sunday in Lent. Our intimations are on your intimation sheet and can I once again encourage you to read all the intimations that are there. Just to remind the elders to collect the envelopes and magazines and they are now ready. Also for you, just to think about the prayer time on Wednesday evening, please do join with this prayer time either in Facebook or get a paper copy of the prayer points at the front door. Thank you. Thank you, Morag. Good morning, everyone. Let us worship God. Let us all now sing to God's praise our first hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation.
Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, all the world. Sing to the Lord and praise him. Proclaim every day the good news that he has saved us. Proclaim his glory to the nations, his mighty acts to the people. Let us pray. God our Father, praise be to you for your love shown to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. The love which restores and heals, which forever presents your people with new beginnings, new songs to sing, new opportunities for service. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your charge to Peter, who, though he denied you three times, was to be your pastor in the new believing community, restored and forgiven by you in the days after your resurrection. Praise be to you, Lord God, who in the power of your Holy Spirit creates, sustains, and renews the church, presenting through it to the world a new vision, new possibilities of healing the wounds of history, new avenues of peace to explore. Almighty God, we come to you in all our mixed-up ways. We confess that often we come to sing old songs, to go over old words. Often we are conscious of a dullness of spirit, a hopelessness, an inability to keep up with a world which seems to move so fast. How can we sing a new song when our thoughts are in the past? How can we seize the opportunities for witnessing to your will when we continue to deny you in fear of what the world might say? And yet, Lord, we confess we do love you or else we would not be here. We are conscious of our weakness and wish to be strengthened in our faith. We are confused by so much of life and long to find the answers. Lord, forgive us our unfaithfulness, our shallow grasp of your love for us. Let your risen glory shine in us with a new brightness that we may care more deeply and speak of our faith more confidently. Give us grace to love what you command and to desire what you promise, that in all the changes and chances of the world, our hearts may reflect your lasting joy of the world through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose words we now pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Boys and girls, I wonder if any of you are frightened of spiders. Anybody here frightened of spiders? No, not really. Well, some people are frightened of spiders. I don't know why, but they just are. Ah, they don't like spiders. I want to tell you a story today about a spider. Now, you know what spiders make. What do spiders make? Webs. That's right. They make webs. And why do they make webs? wonder why they make a web. There must be a reason. They make webs to catch flies because that's what spiders eat for their dinner. They eat flies. This story comes from Denmark, which is a country a long way away from our country across the North Sea or the east of Scotland. And this story comes from Denmark. They say that once upon a time there was a spider and he lived in a barn on a farm. And one day he was standing on a beam high up in the barn 
and he thought, I'm going to make a web because I'm hungry. So, he started to spin a thread. That's something that spiders can do. They can spin a thread. And he started to spin a thread and he fixed it to the beam and then he jumped off. He knew it was safe to do that because he knew that the thread he had made, which was fixed to the beam, would keep him safe. And he was swinging like that on the thread. And he knew the beam was strong so he wouldn't fall. And he, he let more of the thread out, right down to the center of the web. Then he started to swing out and he made threads and fixed them to the wall or to somewhere solid on either side. And he kept doing that until he had a web like the spokes of a wheel. Then he started on the inside and he started to go round and round, spinning another thread round and round and attaching it to the spokes until he got right out to the outside. But that wasn't him finished. Spiders can do something else. They can, they can spin a sticky web, a sticky web, like glue. And he started to work round the spokes of his web with this sticky web, right round and round and round until he got right into the centre. And then he went away and sat up on the beam and thought, that's good. I'll sit here and wait until some flies are caught in my sticky web. And sure enough, it worked. Lots of flies came and got stuck in his web. And he had his dinner. And he became a very fat spider. And very, very content and very happy. And one day, while he was walking about his web, he looked up and he saw the thread, the first thread that he had spun that went up to the beam. And he thought, why did I ever do that? That was a silly thing. That doesn't catch flies. I'll get rid of it. And he pulled it down. Guess what happened? As soon as he pulled that thread away, the whole web collapsed and he had no web. Wasn't that a silly spider to take away the thing that was very important? God tells us in the Bible that he has given us a thread like that to him, and we call that prayer. When we say our prayers, we're speaking to God. Up that thread, speaking to God. So we should never get rid of that. I know a lot of people today who don't, don't pray. They say it's silly to pray because there's no God. But they are wrong. There is a God. And God has provided this way for us to pray. Do you say your prayers? Sometimes? Hmm? Sometimes? Never? Well... You should start. It's a good idea to speak to God. Just talk to God in the way you would talk to your brother or your sister or your friend, because that's how God likes. He likes us to keep in contact with him, because he can help to make us strong, and he can help to make us do the right things. So don't ever break that important connection between you and God, which is prayer. Now we're going to sing from the rising of the sun.
Let us now all listen for the word of God. Our first reading is from Psalm 25, verses 1 to 10. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul, and you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Saviour and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. Our second reading is Matthew chapter 4. <coughs> reading from 1 to 11. The temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand in the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. Thank you, God, for your word to us today. We now sing the hymn, Lord, Thy word abideth.
we heard from the New Testament lesson today that after his baptism, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness before returning to proclaim God's kingdom. As we begin this season of Lent, let us move off into the desert to communicate with our God. Let us pray. Lord God, we gather here today with all our muddled priorities and conflicting agendas. We come to be made whole as the body of Christ. We come to renounce evil so as to be equipped to announce the kingdom of peace. With our God, all things are possible. Lord God, we come here today with the world's clamor ringing in our ears, with comfort zones beckoning us, but the pain of injustice refusing to be shut out. We come for the world's healing and for an end to all lying and deceit. We come to pray for all wars to cease, and that peaceful means of negotiation may be found. With our God, all things are possible. Lord God, we come with the demands of home, family, work and expectations warring in us for space and attention. We come on behalf of those too busy are too exhausted to pray, that our daily lives may be washed in your peace, ordered in holiness, and lit up with your joy. With our God, all things are possible. Lord God, we come with the needs and the sorrows, the pain and suffering of our brothers and sisters all over the world those who are aching physically, emotionally, or spiritually. We come to remember those who are ill. And now in a moment of quietness, we remember especially those known to us who are going through times of illness and difficulty in their lives. Lord, hear us as we remember them before you. With our God, all things are possible. Lord God, we come to realign our lives in the context of your eternity and to commend to your love our loved ones whom we have just mentioned, especially those who have passed through earthly death to the life which has no ending. With our God, all things are possible. Lord God, we come with thankfulness for the gift of life and for the call to holiness. Give us the grace to respond to your calling. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we sing the hymn, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You.
If you are a car owner like me, you are probably dreading your insurance renewal coming in. Last year, after my insurance for my car last year was about £800, which I thought was rather expensive. But after I had my accident, my renewal was due just a few weeks after that, and they put, even though I wasn't to blame, it was not my fault at all, somebody drove into me. They put my insurance up from 800 to 1400 pounds. Well, I complained. I complained by telling them I was leaving. I asked them why, and they said, Mr. York, that's how insurance companies work. I said, well, if that's the way you work, I won't be working with you. And I went to another company. I went online and got the same cover for £600. So it's worthwhile questioning your renewal premium. But why has car insurance gone up? Well, there are some good reasons for increased premiums. The volume of traffic on our roads is increasing all the time. So with more cars on the road, there are obviously going to be more accidents. Also, vehicles nowadays are becoming much more powerful. A Ford Fiesta today has probably got just as good acceleration as the Mini Cooper had in the 1960s. And that was considered then to be a very fast little car, the Mini Cooper and the Mini Cooper S. So with increased power, that means that speed is increasing in many cases. And so the likelihood of an accident increases with speed. You see, power can be a very dangerous thing in a car to a driver who isn't able to use it wisely and to contain it. Power can be a very dangerous thing in human experience too. Lord Acton, a famous 19th century liberal MP, historian and moralist, is quoted as having said, all power corrupts. But that is not what he said. He said, power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Surely no one can deny that power is an important factor in the world today. We speak of power politics, and we know the influence that belongs to large countries and big corporations who use their power sometimes against others. There are other sorts of power too. The power of money has great influence because it can buy the things we want or indeed persuade other people. The power of leadership gives great opportunities to influence those whom we lead, whether it be in business, in politics, or in clubs and societies. The power of communication in teaching or lecturing or journalism is very great. And every one of us has power of some sort or, or another, whether it be amongst friends or as parents or as grandparents. If all that is true, then we surely need to be careful of the way in which we use whatever power we had or have. If Lord Acton's statement is also true, we have to be careful of the temptations which power presents. It's interesting to note in the New Testament that the temptation narrative in the Gospels comes immediately 
after the baptism of Jesus. Remember how at his baptism he heard again the voice of God saying, This is my own dear Son with whom I am pleased. Jesus knew then that he had power. As soon as he realized he had power, he was tempted. Tempted to use it for his own benefit. Each of Jesus' temptations is to do with the possible misuse of power. And in the desert, he had to decide how to use that power. The first temptation was to use his power to turn stones into bread. This he rejected on two main grounds. First of all, it was a temptation to use his special power for selfish ends. No doubt after 40 days he was extremely hungry. He was tempted therefore to use his power to obtain food in a miraculous way, in a way that other people couldn't. But this was rejected by him as being selfish. The other ground on which Jesus rejected this plan was that it does not make it clear that human beings have other important needs, needs which bread does not satisfy. People need more than bread for the stomach. We need the love of God. We need the love of God because we are called to love God and to love our neighbor. The motivation of the Christian to social concern is different from that of the humanist. For the Christian, it's love of God that leads us to our concern for those in need. The church is not just a dispenser of charity. The worship of God and action to help the needy go hand in hand. The true Christian cannot separate the one from the other. Jesus therefore rejected the temptation to turn stones into bread because it would be for selfish ends or it would reduce the scope of his gospel. The second temptation was for Jesus to use his power to perform a miracle, to jump down from the roof of the temple and so prove that he was the Messiah and that God would protect him and catch him. It would have been a quick and easy way to get popular approval without the need for patient and painstaking preparation. But it did away with the necessity for solid work, and it also presumed on God by demanding from him some proof of his power. And so it is today. The church should not bend over backwards to satisfy secular opinions. Opinions on homosexuality, or marriage, or gender, or any other controversial subject for that matter. Politicians do that because that is how they get votes. We often hear it said these days, If only the church would do this, or if only the church would do that, it would attract many more people into its membership. But the purpose of the church is to maintain and stand by the truth of the gospel. It isn't the place of the church to change the fundamentals of the Bible, to satisfy secular opinion and to attract more people. That might seem an easy way to fill the pews, but it is a temptation to be resisted. We need to study carefully and prayerfully what we believe the Bible is telling us of God's will for his people. And then we need to stand up for and live by these principles because we believe that Jesus did that. And Jesus said that people are important and they cannot live by bread 
alone. Lastly, the third temptation that beset Jesus was to use his power to achieve earthly rule, to reign over the kingdoms of the world by force. This was a very real temptation in Jesus' day because there was a great demand among the Jewish people for a leader who had come to lead them in the fight against the Romans so that they could be once again a free state. Perhaps Jesus could be the ruler of this new state. Perhaps his rule could spread all over the world and he could conquer the world by force. But again, Jesus resisted this temptation. He would not use his power for earthly conquest. For this, there seems to be two main reasons. In the first place, that kind of rule is external. It does not have real and lasting effect in the hearts of people. We have seen clearly in recent times that rulers cannot change people by force without provoking revolution. Ultimately, it is the personal beliefs, including religious beliefs, which do most to mold the people of a country. Secondly, empires and periods of rule are passing away. They have their day and they crumble. The Babylonian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Napoleonic Empire, the British Empire, all have risen and then declined and fallen. Yet, the Church of Jesus has survived them all. There is a lot of truth in the words of the hymn, crowns and thrones may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the Church of Jesus, constant, will remain. By trusting the power of the Bible and by founding the church, and by founding the church, Jesus was able to make his message more lasting and more enduring. There is a lesson, therefore, for all those holding power in our churches today. While they may speak out on specific cases, they ought not to identify the church with any political party. Because when the church has done so in the past, as in its adherence to the divine right of kings, any fall of a particular form of government has tended to bring the church down with it. Again, the church should survey and judge all nations and all political views in the light of the Bible. The temptations of Jesus to misuse his power were certainly severe, and they constitute a searching summary of the kind of temptations that we may have to meet today in our own personal use of power. The questions put to Jesus have the very same force for us today. How will we use whatever measure of power we have? How will we use the position we occupy at home or in society, in the community or in the church or in any club? Will we use our power for selfish ends, for self-glorification? Will we use our power to manipulate other people into complying with our demands and wishes? Or will we use our power for showy display? Or will we have sufficient knowledge of the Bible and God's will to be able to resist these temptations as Jesus did? Power tends to corrupt. But if we can exercise our powers humbly, aware of the temptations which may come to us and of the way Jesus himself resisted them, then we may be able in our turn, by God's grace, to survive these tests. Thanks be to God for his word to us today and to his name be glory and praise. Amen. Your offering will now be received.
Let us pray. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, on this first Sunday in Lent, we thank you for the opportunities which this period brings to us. The opportunity to reflect quietly upon the courage of our Lord as he prepared himself to go to Jerusalem, where pain and suffering and derision awaited him. For the opportunity to reflect upon his total commitment to your will. For the opportunity given to us to reflect upon how near or indeed how far we are from him in our commitment to you and in our love for other people. So Lord, we present these offerings today with thanks, praying that you will accept and bless them, that they may be used to spread the good news of Jesus further afield. In his name we offer this our prayer. Amen. We now turn to sing our last hymn, which is Yield Not to Temptation. Go now in peace, and may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and remain with you and with all those you love, today and always. Mm -hmm.